So good morning, everybody. Hope we got all, all uh, uh, breakfast up, I think, there. Um, so I'm George Winter. I'm a, what they call a technical product manager for NetBackup. And I focus on our virtualization technologies uh, as, as it pertains to protecting them. So um, before, I, uh, before I got going, I kind of wanted to ask around. So uh, I know that the VMware guys that focus on VMware I tend to focus on the technologies associated directly with VMware and VMware itself. What about backing up? I mean, how familiar are you with that? How comfortable? Anybody have any you know, significant experience there? And can you just maybe just describe, just briefly, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything, but I mean, your experience there? Yeah. Um, <coughs> we use Veeam. You use Veeam? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so we oh. use Veeam to back up uh, our virtual environment. Okay, very good. And how long have you been using them? Couple months. Okay, a couple months. Backup. Anybody else mm -hmm. involved well. in backups? So are you, is it just so are you a, like a, a virtual machine administrator and a backup administrator kind of? I'm a uh, system administrator. System administrator. And it's a yeah. tough job, and somebody told you you got to do it. Is that the, exactly. the old thing? I had a T-shirt like that. Yeah. Anybody else? We do Beam as well for about a year. Okay, Beam for about a year. Uh, anything else? We got to have some hands over here. S uh, SMVI. SMBI. Okay, so the NetApp solution. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah. Comparison between all the different backup products. You you do what you would like. I write comparison. Oh, you write a comparison. Okay, yeah. Between all the backup products, I've looked at just about all of them. Okay. Okay. Good. Awesome. Can I do backups and data protection consulting with a few books in the summer? Oh, fantastic. That's excellent. Okay, very good. So, um, if I have any errors, if I if you see the errors of my way. Get to, uh, we'll talk about those offline. <laughs> <laughs> nah, just kidding. Okay, so, um, okay, great. So uh, I'd like to keep this very interactive. It kind of makes it more interesting for me, and I'm sure it makes it more interesting mm -hmm. for you, because I've heard people describe how, what it sounds like to listen to me for two hours solid without a break, and it's not pretty. So uh, any questions you have, just blurt them out, and we'll get to those. So this is kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I guess we've got to leave the lights up. I was thinking we'd turn the lights down, just so you're going to have to kind of squint on these. But uh, uh, this is what I wanted to talk about, the semantic git virtualization. There's a lot of kind of FUD out there, people saying that uh, you know, big old company like Symantec, born in the days of you know, standard client-based backups, how in the world could they ever get virtualization? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, solving customers' backup issues. So instead of just droning on about the product, I wanted to talk about specific issues that customers have had. So what we did was we, um, at last uh, year's VMworld session, 2011, I gave a presentation. We gave this joint presentation with a couple of customers. So what we did was we asked these customers come in and tell us about their backup issues and tell us what's going on with backups and the problems that they're experiencing. So this is kind of a point counterpoint sort of thing where I go into the problem that they list. These lists of problems I actually extracted the slide from this presentation. The name of the company shall be, uh, will change to protect the innocent. But uh, I did want to kind of go over that and talk about those issues. So talk about low impact, uh, auto, automatic adjusting VMware backups. So how do we back up these virtual machines and how do we do it and adjust for the dynamic nature of the VMware environment? You know, anybody heard of storage DRS? Great, those are awesome technologies, right? I mean, they're really fantastic. The problem is where the VNDKs were last night may not be anywhere near associated with where the VNDKs may be tonight. So, and from an I.O. perspective, where backup is really focused on I.O., from an I.O. perspective, that is a critical uh, piece of information to understand, to be able to properly tune, fine-tune backups and make sure they're very efficient. Uh, we we'll talked about deduplication. The key word last month was deduplication. The key word this month is virtualization. And we're just going into the cloud keyword, you know, where we got these new keywords every month. So. So we'll, we'll talk about deduplication solutions. We'll also talk about cloud disaster recovery, offsite storage requirements, kind of an important thing, especially in this in this uh, in this world of uh, 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 Sarbanes Oxley. One solution: protect everything. So really, 
People don't want more applications within their data center. They want fewer, right? Nobody wants, you know, to learn more applications, to support more applications, to maintain more applications, to pay for maintenance for more applications. People want less. So this is kind of what uh, we're talking about there. Give me options. Let me restore anything. So I don't, I don't want to just simply back up the VMDKs, get those safely protected, and then I'm done. I want to be able to restore. Because backing up is just a basically a preventative measure to make sure that when it comes time to restore, we can restore if that is necessary. Hopefully it's, necess it's never necessary, but we know that's not necessarily the case. So keeping my job by keeping track of my VM protection. And keeping my job kind of reminds me of if my demos work today, uh, then I keep my job. And if they don't work, then uh, I may be blogging for a, a new position. So just keep that in mind as a, we go along here. And NetBike Up for VMware, there's even more. So talk a little bit about what, what else we got going there. So anyway, let's begin. So does Symantec get virtualization? So this is, we came up with these slides. We got to go. So as a larger corporation, we have to go everything, anytime we make some claim, we have to go through like legions of attorneys and make sure that everything, everything sounds good and we can back this up. So we actually went out and got some numbers and Symantec has, backs up more virtual machines than any other vendor. So this may be in a number of different ways. This may be client-based backups, this may be uh, vStorage API backups, but we back up virtualization more than uh, any other vendor, uh, as you can see. So, uh, this kind of gives you a perspective of who's doing what in the, in the virtual, uh, virtual machine data protection space. It's not just that, though, George, is it? And we, we've been partnering with VMware for, what, 12 years? Longest standing technical partner. Yeah, very, quite a long time. Quite a long time. We've actually uh, had a, um, a virtual machine data protection solution. I was just looking at the other day. We had uh, we spoke first at VMworld in uh, 2006. So. I've been doing this for uh, quite some time, and this is direct support of, if you guys, who remembers VCD or VMware Consolidated Backup? Yeah, those are the good old days, huh? A couple years ago. Can I ask you a question? Um, sure. That, that opening gambit of does semantic get virtualization kind yeah. of begs the question that there are people who think that you haven't or that you didn't in the past. Where do you think that perception came from? So, you know, why, why do people think that? There's no, if it's groundless, why? I think, I think it's just a legacy thing. It's just because um, some of the new guys coming into the marketplace were saying, we're new, we're modern, not like the old guys. And, and you know, the likes of uh, us and CA and Commvault to a certain extent um, were labelled with that. They do their the, legacy. Their legacy, they're old fashioned. They do the, the, this the old way. Um, and because it's, you know, it's that great wave of length of time that we've been doing this, that I just think we were late. So, you know, I, I've certainly seen, and, and we as an organisation have certainly seen that sort of comment in the press, which is, is highly irritating, actually. Well, I think the other thing is that, um, you know, we're looked at as, as the big, you know, the, we have the most market share, so we're like, the guys with the most market share move very slow. And to be sure, there's some truth, I mean, I mean, there's times when we don't move as fast as internally we would like to see semantic move, but I think in the virtualization space, you see, we've been very proactive on this. As a matter of fact, we won Best of VMworld in 2007, uh, so quite a long time ago, five years ago, and the other thing is that we've actually won, that's in the data protection category, and we've won that in that category more than any other backup vendor. Any of the guys you know, we've put one more than, in, 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 than any of those vendors. So this is something where we've worked very hard to create technologies that don't simply provide a basic integration with the vStorage API, but we've worked very hard to create technologies that kind of think outside the box and provide additional capabilities that really other vendors simply cannot provide. Well, and we'll, I trust you, we'll cover that in great detail. That's actually a very good question. So one of the things uh, that we talk about and you hear in semantic, semantic uh, literature is this v concept of V-Ray. So everybody has to have a V dash something, you know, word, so we, so we have ours. But the whole idea about V-Ray is this is actually, uh, this is actually designed to be a, a term that actually describes the technology that we provide. Part of this is V-Ray is uh, understanding 
It's, it's a collection of technologies. It's an umbrella of technologies. It's not a specific feature. So V-Ray covers a lot of things. People ask, uh, I got V-Ray, I want V-Ray. What's the license key for V-Ray? There's no single license key for V-Ray. It actually covers a lot of different areas there. But uh, so V-Ray is, is partly understanding the data that it's not only uh, where the virtual machines exist, how the virtual machines move, how the virtual machines have moved, but it's also, and reporting on that information, but it's also understanding uh, uh, what's inside that virtual machine. Explicitly understanding what's inside that virtual machine. Yeah. So, okay, we all understand what V-Ray does, but the question then becomes to me is that why would I care where it's been? Where it's been? And where it's going, because quite frankly, my data is never at rest, so therefore if I do a backup, better understand where I've been, yeah. actually where I am currently, Sure. and take the right steps to do that backup regardless of wherever it has been in the last 24 hours. Right. And not only that, V-Ray only works with certain operating systems, not everyone out there. That's right. So if I am a 100% Linux VM shop, yes. V-Ray is kind of useless. Uh, that's not true. Uh, we cover we cover Linux quite well, okay. And I and I'll talk about that in a minute. But if I'm also one that does not allow fix access, I do not allow you to look inside my VM from a security perspective. That can happen as well. Sure, you turn it off. You, I'd you rather just, turn it off actually. You can disable it. Well, well, let me talk about exactly what but we cover. Here's the question: is Why you keep on mentioning? Oh, you need to know where you've been, where you are. Why do I care? Well, when, when I say where you've been, when I say it's not maybe you personally, but it's your virtual machine. I, I know you. I know. I know you mean that. I'm but. actually not even thinking about virtual machine. I'm thinking about a virtual application. My virtual application it could be 30 virtual machines. All I want is that application backed up yes. and restored back into the same exact environment I had it before, whether that be a V app, whether that be a V cloud director, whether okay. that be a cloud stack, whether that be on Zen server. I really do not care. I am the application owner. I want that application backed up. I want all its dependencies backed up. I want it restored and tested. I don't care where it's been. All I care is the data is backed up. Yeah, very good. Very so good point. So the question becomes, I mean, if how I do we do this? I mean, forensically it's... knowing where you've been is a great idea. Yeah. But from a backup perspective, I mean, why do I care? Well, these are so so. Uh, these are marketing buzzwords, for, to be sure, and I and I fully comprehend that. But let me go into exactly what we're covering here, and, and I'll, I will respond to all those questions, because that's part of this presentation. See, we're not marketing people. We no, I know, I know that. Marketing buzzwords. We care about what the meat of the product is. No, but I can we get there. Yeah, but I but I felt I felt it's important to talk about V-Ray because we talked about that from a marketing perspective, and I wanted to mention V-Ray in the context that I am aware that V-Ray is used as a marketing term, and I'm going to give you great technical detail about exactly what that is. So this is not a marketing presentation. I'm not, I'm not in a marketing group. I, uh, I'm much more on the technical side. My experience has been 100% technical, so I'm not a marketing guy. I had three slides that talk about this, and I'm done with those. So, it's, so from this point on, it's very technical. So the problems we are solving. So this is... This is the, uh, one of the slides we use. This is from uh, VMworld. This is a description of this company. It's a large shipping company. <coughs> and they have lots of virtual machines. Uh, they have uh, four, in, in development 400. This is actually six months ago. This has probably dramatically changed, increased. They've indicated that they've, uh, I've talked to these folks uh, lately, and they've indicated that things have uh, uh, significantly changed in the sense that they have a lot more virtual machines, a lot more ESC <coughs> servers. So the 5,000 virtual machines, 3,000 in, in development, 3,000 virtual machines in production, with a total of over 600 virtual, 600 ESX servers. So this is a huge environment. I mean, this is very large, and extremely dynamic. I mean, this guy, he's a performance architect that I work with, and he says that when he designs these capabilities, when he begins testing for uh, testing backup applications uh, uh, to support these environments, or just any application that supports this environment, it's so dynamic, it changes. When he begins his testing, the environment changes dramatically by the time he finishes his testing. So he has to kind of keep that in mind. So as you can see, six V center domains, very, very huge. Uh, heterogeneous storage, 
use heterogeneous storage technologies block as well as NFS. So this is their backup environment. They do use net backup, but they tested everything. I was actually there. They tested everything. They tested EMC. They tested NetApp. They tested uh, uh, all, all, the, all the major players here. They tested all, all these because they don't really care. They're very nice folks, terrific folks, actually. And they will very nicely tell you that your product sucks if it sucks. I mean, so they're very upfront with that. Was were their teams separate? Like, was it the VMware guys backing on, backing it up, or did they actually have a backup team? And they no, were they have a backup team. It's so big. The VMware guys don't, do not have time. They don't. They d tend to not have a lot of expertise in that area. Very, very similar to a lot of our customers. They, they tend to be medium to larger customers. That doesn't mean we didn't work in small environments. Obviously, I mean, backup exec focuses very highly on those environments. We have technologies to support both. But in this environment, the virtual machine guys were, were pretty much separate. They wanted to know what was going on. They didn't want us like, hey, you guys back it up and see you later. Uh, make sure they're all backed up. But see, the problem is they create a new virtual machine. They have no idea if they're <coughs> backed up. They're, they're not sure of that. So they, got no, they get no feedback. And then that was one of their major concerns. I don't know if the, I'm not that familiar with net backup, but one of the problems that I see is you have a backup team and you're backing up VMs, but you need to do the restore. Yes. And that's kind of where you kind of need to know where it was because yes. you get 18 LUNs in your environment. Where am I putting these things back? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, and, and when we restore the virtual machine, we restore, we, by default, we restore the virtual machine to exactly where it was previously located at backup time. Now, you may back it up five times in a week, Monday through Friday. You may back it up five times, and that VMDK could be on a different location every time you back it up. So we have the option of restoring it exactly where it was at that backup time. So if it was on Tuesday, it was on Data Store 6, then we'd restore it to Data Store 6. If on Wednesday, it was on Data Store 12, then we do a, we would restore it to that Data Store. However, we also provide the option of restoring it anywhere. So you can take every VMDK. You have 12 VMDKs associated with that virtual machine. You can send them to 12 completely different data stores. Okay. Makes no difference where it was backed up. You can send it to its original location or to an alternate location. Again, why is location important? If I have my data is never at rest, assume it's never at rest. So right. I'm assuming it's always at rest. So if it's never at rest and I move that V app from data center A to data center B somewhere in Timba, East Timbuktu. Sure. And I backed it up from East Timbuktu, but now it's actually back in my regular data center. That's right. I better restore there. Sure. So you're, th again, you're thinking about VM. I'm thinking about application. Right. You better know where my application is residing at this time when you do your restore, because in that disaster that happens, I don't have time to think about which data store to put it on. Right. I don't have time to think about whether or not East Timbuktu is even up and running. All I care about is getting it going and getting it running as fast as possible. So, so when we don't build my don't don't make it complex for me. Okay, but, uh, let me sh when when I show we're actually going to go through a restore and I'll show you exactly how that's performed. When we back it up, we can back up the virtual machine based on things like display name, but that doesn't help you because you want to back up a VM. But we have the what we call intelligent policy. And we can back up that virtual machine based on a V app. So essentially, if you define the backup as a V app, and that V app includes four different virtual machines, eight virtual machines, 12 virtual machines, we back that up as a group. You also include the anti affinity rules that are inside of the V app to keep V app entities from running on top of each other. So if I have a V app where I must have my database running on a separate host and my 16 web front ends, different than my middleware because of the load that has it, can you actually restore it appropriately without me having to think? Well, if, if so you're saying that the database is on a separate uh, it virtual be, machine? It could be having a massively large Oracle database. And where is the database located? Somewhere else. Well, no, I mean, is it on a physical system? Is it on a virtual system? It's all, let's say 100% virtualized. That's a VM. Then absolutely, we can back that up. No, I know. I'm not talking about backup. No, back you know, it up as a group. rules for restoration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so we would actually, we can specify that restore. I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you all this okay. in a minute. So it's in, what you're looking for is intelligent policy. And, okay, and, 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 and I will describe that in great detail. Okay. So. 
What's that? Application, application awareness. For is application awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how I define the application, not how you define the application. You can do it how we define it, and you can customize it to exactly how you define it. Yeah, but I've already defined it. Why can't you just pick right. it up from the vApp itself? Not, not in the backup, but in the rules that are already established in the virtualization in environment. Well, in the vCenter, I have a vApp. That's how I define my application. Okay. It has anti-affinity rules already built into there. Why don't you just pick those up? Or if I have Vin and I want to use Virtual Infrastructure Navigator to come out and say, hey, this is how I define my app. <coughs> or I'm using VCOps Enterprise and I've defined my app, or I'm using APM, and I've defined that app that way. So there's multiple ways to define an application. Yes. I've used one of them or all of them. Yes. And if you're not picking up application awareness from that, your restoration of <coughs> hammer the runtime for a disaster recovery, that would be really bad. Yeah. Because now I have to go, not only do I have to restore in a hurry. You have to find. I yeah. have to now performance tune in a hurry. Sure. Which would be a major problem. Yes. Okay. You're doing both at the same time is generally hard when you have the CEO breathing over your neck. Let me let me get to this, and we'll get, we'll talk to intelligent policy, and we'll cover that in great detail. Okay. okay so um, anyway, let me just get back to this guy. So this is what we're going <laughs> need for uh, this customer needed to be able to do physical backups and virtual backups with a single application. Didn't want to buy two applications. Didn't want to buy a virtual only application because that didn't solve their problem. Their problem was they wanted to do this all within a within a single application. Uh, physical environment included array-based snapshots, so they use arrays, and, and the array the array technology varied. It wasn't simply a single array technology. They wanted to keep, uh, in their environment, they wanted to keep, um, they wanted to keep uh, their options open because they wanted to these array vendors to compete against each other. They felt they got the best pricing with that methodology. Lots of different applications. Oracle was big there and NDMP backups for their filers. So backup targets. Wanted to, they want to go tapeless, but they can't because they have extremely long-term retention uh, restrictions for certain portions of their data. So essentially what they do is, uh, is they, uh, uh, they want to go tapeless, but they still need tape. Tape is a critical component of their backup environment. We're storage agnostic. There's, you know, there's a common thread out there, hey, all we do is we, do, we support tape. There's no truth to that. We could care less what you use for us. We want to be able to support all those storage technologies. And of course, they, wanted, they were uh, very keen on hardware-based deduplication appliance. When we say appliance, we mean a self-contained appliance that does nothing but deduplication is pre-configured for you. So it's tuned. Everything is tuned up for you. All you have to do is plug it in, hook it up, and answer a few questions in your deduping data. So, uh, they had net 30 net backup servers in this environment, what they were doing. Okay, so some other points here. Simple, scalable, minimal impact to those ESX servers. There's always gonna be a little bit of impact, but they wanna minimize that significantly. And disaster recovery, legal offsite requirements. Uh, we talked about that before, but they also wanted to be able to do, perform disaster recovery. They wanted to ha have options. If, if one source of restore fails, they wanted to be able to go to a different source as well. Occasional restore of the entire VM. This was not a very common restore scenario, but one that was critical. It isn't like they had to do this all the time, but when they had to do it, it was very, very important, as you can imagine. And a uh, single file restore for Linux as well as Windows. So they, they have a very strong Linux environment, mostly Linux, some Windows. They didn't use their storage arrays for replication? Uh, sometimes. They used, uh, they used all sorts of technologies. The storage arrays weren't appropriate for certain of, of their virtual machines, the way they were configured, because they, weren't, they, they were not necessarily mission critical virtual machines that had to be restored. They had an SLA, but like you have to restore it within 30 minutes. But these were, uh, these were virtual machines that were important nonetheless. So, on that important data, they, they hosted those virtual machines on, on very expensive storage, and for other virtual machines, they did not. They didn't require that kind of restore SLA, you know, that quick restore SLA. Okay, so single file, that was actually very common. Very common approach that they performed these single files. 
So design criteria. So the, when do, we came up with net backup, this is a design criteria that we use. Just a couple of slides here about that. We wanted to integrate our virtualization support into the net backup, what I call the net backup ecosystem. So net backup writes to tape, writes to dedupe. We have dedupe targets. We have hardware-based dedupe. We have software-based dedupe. Uh, we have support disk. We support cloud as backup targets. We can back up Oracle databases. We can back up SAP. We can back up uh, also we have dozens, over a dozen client uh, software. You have a question or? No, I'm just crossing just, my head. Just Sorry. making sure, that I got that. <laughs> getting that coffee going. Okay, so, so anyway, but we wanted to integrate, take in that existing environment that's actually very mature and very capable. We wanted to take and interject virtualization into that so that we had a very seamless, very seamless uh, virtualization uh, uh, offering. It was very powerful. So support physical and virtual environments. And there goes the VPN. So we want to be able to support physical and virtual environments in, the, in this case. So we needed to, we'd obviously physical systems are not going away. I mean, I'm, virtual machine stuff is fantastic, but we have customers that have 150 terabyte databases that do 20,000 transactions a second. They host that on a single, on this big massive hardware and uh, with a tremendous amount of storage. That's always, you know, when you have a 150 terabyte database, the amount of storage you have to have is like 400 terabytes, you know, because you have to mirror it and all that sort of stuff. So. Uh, these are tremendously large, and the only way to back those up, uh, the only way to, to present those systems is place them on physical systems, and that requires uh, clients. Or maybe integration with arrays where you snap mirrors and things like that to be able to back up those technologies. So uh, for multiple data protection technologies, one method does not serve all needs. So when we talk about backups, vStorage API for data protection. You guys are all familiar with that, pretty much. And uh, so that's a great technology, but it's one technology of many, and it doesn't necessarily solve all of our backup issues that we encounter. So we wanted to be able to take a look. I mean, we talked about these V apps, and those are cases where maybe a single backup technology simply does not have the capabilities to be able to support these restores. And what you, aspects of vStorage are you using? What's that? What aspects of the vStorage API are you using? What aspects? And you said there's other things that you're using, so what are those other things you're using? Uh, the uh, standard client-based backups? Where I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I promise I'll talk about those. I, uh, what aspect of the vStorage APIs are you using? vStorage API for data protection. I know, but which aspects? There's multiple aspects of it. Uh, tell me what your, we use, we use the vStorage API, the basic vStorage API. Well, there's networking, there's hot add. We there's support that. Those are transport methods, we support all those. So you actually. For backups and restores. So for backups, you actually do direct SAN access? Absolutely. Wow. I've done that since the beginning. We do, we support the transport methods, we support hot add, NFS, and network based backups and restores. We support hot add backups and restores. Any configuration, we support all aspects of that. Change block tracking is another attribute associated with a vStorage API. We completely support that. Actually, <coughs> provide additional support in that area. Okay, so originally the VCD was the storage, the SAN access that's no longer around. Are you using VCD? Well, we're not using, uh, we don't actually, in this version, we don't support VCD anymore. We supported VCD very early on. And we support a direct SAN access with VCB as well. But uh, we, sit, we don't support a VCB anymore. It's not supported in vSphere 5. Uh, so this version does not, 7.1 did, but we don't support VCB anymore. This is, this is actual vStorage API for data protection integration. Direct integration, not, does that answer your question there? No, it doesn't actually. <laughs> Help me out here. I'm asking how you support, I'm actually asking you about your technology. You okay. say you support this. There are multiple parts of it. I understand you support the networking version on that. That's right. But when you do the store, the, the SAN storage, direct connect to SAN, yes. whether it be iSCSI or FiberChain. That's correct. How are you doing that? 
not that you support it. I want to know how you're doing it. Because are you doing it at, through a virtual appliance? Are you doing no. it through physical machines? Yes. Which one? All. So you can do fiber channel access from a virtual appliance. Well, if you're using a virtual appliance, if the fiber channel access is available via the ESX server, we work with that. But that's the question, is whether if you're using a virtual appliance on the ESX server, typically in that environment, you use hot add, because that, that provides direct access. And we or support that. you target to it. We do all of that. You we support all of that. I mean, that's kind of why I was... I mean, so I know there are vendors... How you do things, so you need to tell me how. I will. I'm getting there. Okay, so anyway, this is, uh, this is uh, we wanted this to be very simple to use, very flexible. We have this product called BMR, allows us to do physical to virtual, virtual to physical. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's a nice uh, technology as well. Okay, large shipping companies backup issues. So the problem, we require a simple and scalable backup solution that creates minimal impact to the ESX server. So a couple of ways that we can do this, vStorage API for data protection and the intelligent policy. We're going to talk about both of those right now. So who knows the vStorage API backup process? Who is very familiar with that? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, I'll go through this very quickly, I promise. If you have questions, you got to stop me. Okay, so here we have our backup target, our backup system, our storage, and our ESX servers. This storage could be NFS, this storage could be iSCSI, and this storage could be SAN, right? So it could be any one of those three. We support all of those in every transport method that vStorage API provides. vStorage <coughs> API provides transport methods in SAN, fiber, iSCSI as shared storage, direct attached storage uh, using network-based backups, or hot add. So if you have a virtual appliance, the virtual appliance would be hosted on that ESX server, and you can access the data via hot add, via the hot add transport, what they call the transport method. We support all three of those. You can have this backup host in a physical system. You can have this backup host in a virtual machine, just be do doing network-based backups, or you can have that in a virtual machine be doing hot add. The restriction with hot add is the ESX host that is hosting that virtual machine backup system must have direct access to those SCSI lines to be able to do, uh, to be able to do hot end. So it must have direct access to that. If it does not have direct access, then uh, you cannot uh, uh, back it up using hot end. You could always back it up using network-based transfers, but it cannot be used, uh, supported using hot end. Okay. Is it intelligent there? I mean, so if you set it up to do you know, direct SAN and that's your preferred method, but if one of the ones isn't mapped it, or it, set up, does it so fail many, back to hot add next, and then does it fail back to network load yeah. last? I mean, does it? Yeah, so, so we actually create a hierarchy of transport methods within the policy. So all of those transport methods are supported, and you can list them as a hierarchy. So this is the preferred method. If that one fails, fall, fail over to this one. If that one fails, fall, fail over to this one. So we actually pre, uh, uh, present it as a hierarchy of transport methods. So in, in, if your DNS is working, things are working, the network-based backup should always work. That should always be available to you. So if, if, if in case the backups um, uh, are critical for a certain group of virtual machines, and even if the SAN isn't working or somebody uh, readjusted the SAN so the loans aren't accessible to the backup system, then the backups would still pro progress. We had a customer, we did that, had a customer, they did some, they installed it, we we're doing a POC, they installed it on Friday, uh, and everything was working. They did a couple of test backups, and then they backed up 200 of their virtual machines over the weekend. And over their weekend, the, um, uh, the storage administrator came in and uh, readjusted everything, and none of the backups worked. So they had specified SAN only. If they just said SAN and then it worked, <coughs> this would have worked perfect. So you still have to specify what your failback modes are? Well, you, yeah, it's a pull-down list. I'll, I'll show you Why that. Why not just make it automatic? If one doesn't work, fall to the other. It, 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 that's the way it's set up by default. So Why allow me to change it? Here's the thing is that if you've got the highest performing thing, keep it. Because some customers have asked us, we need flexibility. So some customers have asked us, they said, look, if the SAN fails, I don't want the backup to occur. Because if it fails, 
I don't want it to go over the network because my network link is very critical to me and I don't want the transfer to occur over that network link. So I want you to be able to turn that off if that's my option. So It also depends on how critical the application is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they may decide that on you know, lower tiered applications they don't actually want that to happen so they can take that off. Yes. So anyway, we support all those transport methods. When we create snapshots of the virtual machines, we can limit the number of snapshots. You'll talk about this in intelligent policy, how that is working. A snapshot is created, we copy the data to the backup, and then snapshots are released. So that's a vStorage API. These are the transport methods. Yes, sir? Do you have integration with other storage vendors for the snapshot? Uh, in the sense of the, the vStorage API by itself is a storage agnostic, doesn't matter what kind of storage it's on. Actually, we don't necessarily, if you're just using the plain vStorage API, we don't even know what kind of storage it's on. Uh, I mean, we know, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's, it's storage agnostic. I guess what his question is, is like if you want to use NetApp API, yeah. snapping? Yeah. Yes. So you want to use the NetApp engine, not your engine, because it's more efficient, I can snap faster NetApp? The, you, is there a person on the, on the planet that prefers to use something besides our and well, I mean, <laughs> if, if I mean, you know, if I can take 255 snaps in 10 minutes on the storage side, can I? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm teasing. You know what I'm I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are these other technologies. NetApp is a great example. They have the Snap Manager for virtual infrastructure. In this release, we've created uh, what we call a feature called Replication Director. It's, uh, uh, our idea of this is uh, in the virtual machine environment, we want to take care of backups. We want to be able to automatically do this for your backup environment. With the replication director, we want to automatically control your arrays for you. So in the NetApp world, you have things like SnapVault, SnapVir, SNVI, those uh, Snap Manager for Virtual Infrastructure, which essentially utilizes their snapshot technology to be able to back up virtual machines. In those cases, uh, we are going to use Replication Director as a replacement for SMVI. We're, we're considering whether we would integrate with SMV, SMVI itself, but Replication Director will actually uh, uh, provide direct VMware integration. It's not in this current release. It's, it's planned for the next release. So a direct virtual machine integration using the inherent snapshot technologies that exist inside that array is, uh, is coming in the next release. So today you don't support the VAI? Well, the vSorge API for array integration, it, there's nothing for us to support. It's, that, it's up to the vendors to support that. We take advantage, if you en enable VAI, we will take advantage of those uh, uh, significant I.O. improvements, and you'll see backups improved. I think the question is more, have you worked with the storage vendors to make a unique hook there? Yes. You know that, what I'm saying? That's like, what we're do doing. Do anything that nobody else does there. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And that's the replication director yes, feature sure. that we don't have that today. That's coming out in 7.6. We're 7.5 today. So I mean, the replication director effectively, are you saying this is, a, this is an SRM-like type tool or not? Well, it's, uh, it's SRM. And the SRM is specific. SRM is a software solution specific to VMware that uh, only replicates virtual machine data. Replication Director is specific to the NetApp hardware that replicates virtual machine data as well as other data, Oracle databases, that sort of thing. So uh, Does we it do every, so can I use both in the same environment, or yes. should I only use one? No, you could use you could use both in the same environment. Mm -hmm. They're different tools for different needs. So if you if you have if you have something where you want to be able to create a tool that is it allows you to be able to restore from a snapshot a virtual machine then uh, the replication director would be a great technology. But if you have something uh, where you don't need that and the data doesn't happen to exist on a NetApp uh, array or you know, one of these arrays, then you'd use a, a different restore technology. Do you have the capabilities to integrate into SRM so that I can get the benefits of both? Not worlds? currently. We don't have any direct integration with SRM. So do you do the same thing that SRM does when it comes to the virtual environment? Allow the VMs to and all that. Well, yeah, yeah, we, uh, of course, we, we always, whenever we, that's what I, when I showed on the vStorage API slide, that's when we do a backup, we, we by default, quiesce that virtual machine as part of the backup process. You can turn off the quiesce. Uh, some customers uh, have their own way of 
uh, managing the quiesce, and they prefer that. But by default, it's turned on. Can you use the VSS inside of Windows? To yeah. Of quiescent, yes. Know. So, so there is a VSS provider that's included with VMware tools. So when you install VMware tools on a Windows system, there's a VSS provider. So you can use that VSS provider. Uh, if you've seen some of the blogs out there, uh, VMware's VSS provider, uh, especially on in vSphere 4, had some issues with newer Windows OS's. 2008 R2 is a great example. And so what we did was we created our own. Uh, VSS provider that can be used instead of VMware's. So if you want to use VMware's, continue to use that. That's fine. But if you have a newer, uh, if you have a newer issue, uh, like a newer OS that's not being properly quiesced, you can use our VSS provider. We provide it free of charge. It's included in the distribution. Would you use that for backing up Exchange if you wanted to do? Something? You could do that. Yeah, and and not only does that, but our VSS provider actually uh, uh, it uh, truncates Exchange logs as well. SQL. So we do some, it, you could be used for SQL. Now we have an explicit support for SQL and Exchange in 7.5. So this is explicit support where we, not only do we back them up and we quiesce them, but also we catalog the information. So that's important. A lot of people talk about, hey, we quiesce the virtual machine, we quiesce the database, but they don't catalog that information. So cataloging means you can pull up a GUI, see the database objects, select them, and restore from that, from that interface. You don't have to pull up the entire virtual machine, take a look inside and see what you want to restore. Do These do are that? explicit restore options. Do you do that in the file level too? I mean, can you index the... We always do it, yeah. You can, you can turn that off. <laughs> we always turn it off, but it's it give you that opportunity, but it's on by default. And we index the data for all Windows virtual machines. Well, we don't do Windows 95, but I mean, essentially all Windows virtual machines and Red Hat and SUSE Linux. So I'll show you that in a minute. So. You're talking about transport methods. So these are the three tra transport methods. This is network-based transport methods. The thing about networks, this is, the reason I'm mentioning this is when we get, uh, when we start talking about performance, this is key. This is for, it's a key to understand exactly how the data is transferred. This is why I kind of focus on this. So just so a simple diagram, if we're doing network-based transfers, the data is pulled off of the data store, doesn't matter what technology the data store is used. It could be uh, direct attached storage, uh, fiber, makes no difference. Pull that data off the data store. The ESX server does that work. Then the ESX server creates packets, sends that data over the network to the backup system. Okay, so the components in red, it's kind of hard to see with the lights on, but the components in red are impacted by this transfer. So essentially every component <laughs> is shrouded in red, and every component is impacted by this transfer. The key to this, and the one that we probably care most about, is the fact that this ESX server is impacted. Because when we're doing this backup, this ESX server is quite busy. How many of you guys have ESX servers that are like 20% utilization? Nobody, right? You don't buy these things to have them at 20% utilization. If they have system resources available, you add another virtual machine to it. You don't go out and buy new hardware, you add a new virtual machine. So these systems, by definition, are quite busy. So uh, now we're adding impact on this for the backup. It's up to you whether you want to use this method, but this is just informational to let you know who's doing that work. Who's pulling the data off the storage, who's creating packets and sending that data over the network. Okay, so that's network-based packets. Then the next one, is a shared storage configuration. You're talking about iSCSI fiber, fully supported for backups as well as restores. Some vendors only support backups. They don't restore, uh, support restores over SAM. We support both. So this is for fiber or iSCSI. This is the vStorage API provides this capability. All you have to do is present this LUN to the backup system. And in this case, notice that we're not going over the LAN anymore. And notice that the ESX server is not shrouded in red. So it's not impacted with the backup operations. So essentially, uh, that's a direct data transfer. You can, if you've backed it up over fiber, we will by default select fiber as the restore option, but you can restore it using any method. You can restore it using network, you can restore it using fiber, you can restore it using uh, hot end. How, how do you lock that down if you're gonna give basically one host access to everything? 
Is there an I was issue there? Ask that question. Like, I've, it's been the same with other things in the past. It's like it's kind of scary, especially prior to when you'd actually have to mount the whole the lung. Like a, I don't know. But that's what you're does doing it, anyway. That's what this this does. It's basically VCB on steroids. It's, it's not VCB. It's similar to it. It's similar to VCB, but I've asked this of VMware, and I asked them about, well, isn't this just a, a VCB 2.0? No. They said the code is completely different. But it's not VCB, the same tech, underlying technology. It's a, similar, it's a similar concept, but quite different, yeah. So you need to use presentation and zoning inside a fiber channel, and you need to use proper um, access controls for ISTEP. And you, if you're using iSCSI, you need to use firewalls and ensure that the storage network is the storage network and nothing else is on it. So VLANs may help there. If you're using blade chassis, that's about all you can do. Right. So, so essentially what happens is... But then you still have to worry about SCSI reservation conflicts, the additional load on the controllers. I mean, this does have an impact on ESX, but it's not as heavy as transferring all the data through it. Yeah, it's but actually the lines quite get less. locked because that host gets messed up. It'll lock that one, and therefore it will become unavailable to all your ESX hosts. And there's so many there's so many HBAs that can be sent down to a blade from a chassis too. That and you also need to worry about because if the HBA on that server it has to be a physical server for Fiber Channel, it can't be a virtual machine. iSCSI can be virtual because you can just do iSCSI targets to inside the, the virtual network. But on the, this one, if that if the HBA fails on that machine and you don't have a backup HBA, and I'm not talking about backup ports on the same HBA, I'm talking about two HBAs. There's a good, ch and they're not in failover mode, and one of them locks up, it'll lock your entire line, which means the whole ESX cluster gets locked. And did you, I'm talking about restore, and so you guys have some nastiness in now. Do you have any type of instant restore options that brings up your own storage, your own NFS, your own, so you can just storage your motion of back instead of having to remap, iSCSI, remap, fiber, do you do anything like that? Well, our restores are so fast. <laughs> nah, just kidding, just kidding. No. So, so no, so, uh, yeah, no, I know what you're referring to the instant power on. We don't have that today, but, um, in a future release, we hope to have something uh, similar to that, maybe better. But uh, we're working on that. I, I can't really talk much about that. I uh, just know one of the big challenges is you get a VM with 15 terabytes of data. Oh, yeah. And you need it that. takes a long time to restore it. You yeah. You've got a 20 minute SLA, you know, that, you know, I mean, how do you do that, right? I mean, how do you get that back up fast? Well, one of the ways, I mean, like if you're using, when we support Replication Director, you could, re, you know, just revert to a snapshot, you'd be up assuming and running. Assuming that you, yeah, assuming you've got but, but if you didn't back it up that way, you know, yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Uh, hot add as well, I just wanted to focus on this. So, so we support all three transport methods, backups as well as restores. So we did some testing, talking about the load. We actually did some direct testing. On this, uh, with a, we did a benchmark. We teamed up with VMware, uh, uh, Cisco, and uh, we did some testing on this. What we did was we essentially looked at vCenter, looked at the load on the ESX server during a backup. So this is not the load inside the client. This is not the load on those virtual machines. This is the load of the ESX server. So this is disk I.O., and this is CPU utilization. So what we did was we had... Uh, 20, I think it's 23 virtual machines hosted on this ESX server. We did backups of uh, these. Were, we didn't do them all simultaneously. We did them uh, serially. We did multiple uh, virtual machine backups at a time, but we did them serially. We didn't want to like because well, we, we couldn't do them simultaneously. It just wouldn't work. I wouldn't have, didn't have enough network. So essentially, what we did was put clients in the virtual machine, running virtual machines, did a backup. This is the load that occurred on the ESX server. Is there a memory graph with this as well? I, I, didn't, I didn't take the memory, but the so memory... The reason I ask that is that a lot of people are going with stateless computing now. Yeah. And when you do auto-deploy an entire ESX environment, your kernel is actually running in RAM, and I'd like to see the comparison there as far as memory load goes. Yeah. Because you could run into a contention there when that runs. You could absolutely. I mean, this, would, this could actually... It, it requires some memory, especially if you're using a dedupe client. Mm -hmm. That'll require a lot of memory. 
So uh, this is what we did. So how would that work out? Because whether you are stateless or not, the kernel still gets loaded in memory with you boot from disk. Right, right but the, the load, if it was, if it was <coughs> um, adjusted during a backup, if there was more memory utilization, that's why I wanted to see another graph here. Okay. Memory utilization when a backup kicks off yeah. onto the ESX box. I, I didn't, take, I didn't yeah. copy that graph. I, sh I should have. After I did this, I thought that would, would have been interesting as well. But what you'll see, so this is a standard backup. So a couple of things, note the load that occurs on the system and note the time that occurs. These times are linear in the sense that when I compare this with the fiber-based backups. So then we did another backup. We did SAN backups. So essentially, this is backing up exactly the same thing. These are both full backups. Incrementals, too, too many variables there how much incremental data is there. So this is another backup, and this is the exact same load. So this is essentially just an extension of the same graph. We broke this off a little bit, but this is the load on the ESX server with fiber-based backups. So as you can see, there's essentially no load on the ESX server. Now, there's load on the storage. I'm not saying that these are costless. You know, there's no cost to this, because there is load on the storage. We'll pull, we're pulling data off the storage. But uh, in this case, uh, the, the, during a full backup, very little load on the ESX disk from the ESX perspective. There's still load on that disk. It's just that the ESX doesn't know what's happening. Okay, and then this is uh, CPU utilization. So a couple of things. Obviously, the load is less and the time is much less. This was 10 gig Ethernet and 8 gig fiber. So very comparable technologies, and even with the network-based backup, there's a quite a bit of time that occurred. Can you tell me what the megabytes per second and stuff like that is? Because quite frankly, I can't read that graph. Uh, this is... Is it k-bytes? I'll have to look here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's k-bytes. And, and the top graph is 300,000. Can I say a question that's sadly not directly related to this particular slide, but I'm not sure whether you're going to go back to it, which was... The, the transport method? No, no, before you, um, when you were doing the opening uh, explanations, you were saying that you support vApps. That's right. Um, but there's actually two different types of vApp in VMware. It's the vApp that lives in the uh, virtual center is also a vApp concept in vCloud Director. Yes. Are you doing any integration along the lines of VMware vCloud Director so people can back up from within the cloud? Yes. Yeah. Is, that, is that something you have now? Or? We, we don't have it yet. That'll be in the next release. Uh, whenever you're dealing with software and you can't answer the question, you it's always say it's always in the next release. release. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So just I gave away my secrets here. But okay. no, but tr seriously, though, uh, we are actively working on that, have been actively working on it uh, since the 1.0 API. Have it's 1.5 currently. Have you actually seen much customer demand for that kind of? We have seen some. There, and, and we expect it. I mean, when you go to VMware sessions, like we just came back from Partner Exchange, the vCloud sessions are packed. They're always full. Okay. Now, those are resellers. Uh, when we went to VMworld last year, the vCloud sessions were very popular. So uh, based on that, uh, we have service providers where that integration is critical to them. And uh, it, it, the vCloud is not a simple backup. Uh, issue. There's a lot of integration. Well, We've you've got the actual vCloud itself to back up and then the VMs right. that reside in your book. Yep. Next release, you're saying. And what's, what's yep. the schedule for that? Is Later this year. Q4. Q4, okay. Yeah, Q4. Later this year means anything from now till December 31st. Okay. Another software secret. There. I'm giving away all my secrets. So, George, you probably can't talk much about what that will do because it's a future product. But could you talk about the types of things that you would like to do or that you expect might be different about backing up a vCloud environment as opposed to a, a vSphere environment? Well, the big deal about vCloud is multi-tenancy. So it's, it's, you have to be able to understand that uh, and delineate the different vCloud environments so you have multi-tenancy and be able to back up and restore. The key to that is that when you do a restore, you only want the person that has, you know, that's using a certain portion of vCloud you only want that person to be able to have access to, visibility into, and be able to restore only their or their environment. So that's that's the key uh, the key development there. The other thing is that when you back up a vCloud, the way that the virtual machine is presented to to us is uh, very unuser friendly. I mean, you know, all sorts of digits, alphanumeric thing that has nothing to do with the host name or the display name <coughs> of the virtual machine. 
So we need to be able to understand that information, catalog it, and restore it so, so that's invisible to the user. So our goal is to make this as easy as our virtual machine uh, backup and restore technology. And be, be able to understand the vApps in the vCloud. All of that is planned for that release. So you've been talking about multi-tenancy and restore. In, in that release, are you expecting that you'll be offering a, a, a tenant? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely. Because otherwise, it's pretty much useless. Because I mean, nobody is going to use vCloud if, if somebody can, you know, get access to very critical data that they have no reason to access. It needs to be self-service in the same absolutely. way that It absolutely has to. Yeah. That's our goal as well. Okay, so. So right now you cannot restore the vCloud, but you can back, back up whatever is in vCenter, which could be the vCloud instances. This is, it gets back to what I was talking about applications. Yeah, and that's. And that's why I was talking about applications, because it's not just about what I think an application is. It ends up being what I put into the cloud as the application. Okay. Well, so, so again, we don't have direct support. You can actually restore into a vCloud environment, but it's not easy. I know that you have to restore it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So. 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 Uh, Again, why do I care about the, the you, you say I go to my display names, I go to my VM names. Well, when I go to any type of cloud environment, the display name and the, the VM names are useless to Well, me. I'm just I'm just trying to back that, the way, if you backed it up today. When you back it up today, the information. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, we, when we support vCloud, when we provide that support, we're not. That's will be uh, an abstract layer to the user. They won't understand that. We will. It should be an abstract, abstract layer. layer. Anyway, take that viewpoint. That name only then becomes a way of finding out the managed object reference, and which then doesn't change because that's the only thing really in, in the end. Exactly. Uh, that UID, the UID, the name. Geographs. Do you have reference architecture that you know you benchmark on that you say, hey, you know, this is a standard. X type of hardware, you know, it's a meta, you know, whatever, storage. Here's the speeds we see, one gig, here's 10 gig, here's what you can expect for the passport. Do you have that published someplace, or is it just? Well, we, we did this benchmark. The benchmark is publicly available. It is published. Uh, anybody can go to the Symantec site and download it, so it's not internal or anything. What we found in our benchmarking and our testing, we've done extensive testing in this area. We've always found that uh, in, in the environment, that we, uh, uh, any time we've ever done a benchmark with net backup, the performance that we've been able to achieve has only been limited by the hardware. So if we're uh, backing up in a one gig fiber environment, it's the one gig fiber, uh, uh, the performance we can get out of that one gig fiber is the limiting factor. It's never been net backup. So in that testing, that has been consistent across, uh, across uh, um, you know, regardless whether it's a networking technology or fiber, different fiber iSCSI technologies. So we have done that. And that's, that's just been a simple, uh, 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 you know, an answer to, you know, a pretty complicated question. But, I mean, that's essentially what we found. And we have done extensive testing of, of this. I guess the reason I ask is, you know, customers are going to want to know exactly. what type of restore speeds are they going to get. And I guess if you can show that 10 gig or 40 gig or whatever, is going to cut that time down. Yeah, I think that's beneficial. No, absolutely. Yeah. That. yeah, and and the benchmark in the benchmark we also discussed. There's certain limitations with the with the API itself, backup limitations and restore limitations, and we outlined outlined that in the document as well. But uh, for example, uh, if you have 10 gig fiber, and you create a single backup stream, you probably can't. You we and we. Uh, covered this with uh, VMware. You can't saturate that 10 gig fiber or 8 gig fiber, 10 gig network. You can't saturate that with a single stream. You can saturate it with multiple streams, but a single stream will not saturate that in spite of the fact that the disk, underlying disk, and all other associated hardware might be able to support that. But a single stream will not saturate it. We talked about VMware with this at great length. So this is the one before you get going. On drum, roll, no, drum roll. Are you going to have something that like 
when you do a restore or you're doing a backup, I mean, does the appliance say, hey, the congestion's network, or it's CPU in the host, or it's, yeah. Yeah. you know, do you, do you have that intelligence? Is that well, the plan? Uh, we're, we're, work, we're working on this right now, so yep. so the requirements of inward engineering, and we're at that point in like a second, so we're going to build that out as a utility tool to enable, you know, partners and customers to go and measure just those kind of things. You know what it's like with an engineering team, uh, we ask for this much, they say they're going to give us this much, and we get that. Or even less. <laughs> um, Sometimes, yeah. So, I know you guys are probably going to say you're going to talk about this, but you really haven't answered any of my other questions yet, but, so I'm going to try again. <laughs> okay. Backups fail all the time. Yes. If you tell me that backup never fails, I'll never believe that. So it failed. Backups fail for whatever reason. Can we can we time. scratch that from the tape uh, taping? Can we? I can't. Just <laughs> anyway, so the question is, what in your tool will tell me that it failed? Can I get alerted on my cell phone? Can I get alerted on my Twitter account? Can I get alerted anywhere to say, hey, your backup failed, and this is the reason why? We've been using SMS for years. Well, yeah, but we also... Uh, but I'm also not talking about backup failing as in I couldn't get the bits. I'm calling about, hey, the bits aren't good. In other words, the verification failed, or does NetBackup do, do self-restoring and testing to see if that VM object will even, even restore, and or will it boot? Like what I think he's saying is, it, you know, does it, is there a way to... I don't want to script, script it. I don't want to script it myself. Yeah. I want net backup to basically do my testing in an automatic fashion so that I don't have to be bothered because right now if I have to do it, I'll guarantee you that most people, even though they say they do it, yeah. test maybe maybe two percent of their tapes, two percent of their backups if they're lucky. Yeah. So I think that's like running a job and the job would automatically boot up the VM and it would say, Hey, it pings. I can run a custom script that I, you know, that you define, I define on it, and then it powers it back down and says that's good, you know, that type of stuff. Because if you don't have that, and with automation, with capabilities of sandboxing and everything like that, you have a very limited subset of what you could have from a product perspective, because that is just absolutely necessary. Especially you when you start talking. Well, we don't, we don't validate. The, th the thing you about. You start talking about terabytes and petabytes of VMs that are being backed up in clouds. Right. That's right. If I can't, and you tell me who is going to sit there and do that by hand. Well, so so let me ask you this. So so, so this is a problem that we've kind of wrestled with with this. Now I know backup exec is actually coming out with with the uh, validation. Yeah. So uh, but this is a problem that we've wrestled. So we have terabytes of virtual machine data, and to be able to test those requires significant resources to be able to run those and test those. Now to test those to be able to run those from a backup from your backup application, you can't be doing backups and you can't be doing restores. You gotta be just doing testing. So now we have environments where if Why you- not? Because you can't- do, I should be able to do both all the time. Sandboxing works. And that's what your VR site's for, right? Because, because when you're writing, because, well, it depends on the application. We could actually do it, but if you have an application that writes multiple backups to a single file, when that file can only be, do, be accessed by one, uh, process at a time. If you're doing a, if you're doing, if you're mounting that VM and running it, you can't be doing, you can't be adding files to that. You can't be adding appending files to that data. It's a VM. It's called a snapshot. So yes, I can. So no, I'm talking about backups. I'm not talking I'm about talking, snapshots. I'm talking about the same thing. The technology exists. So tell, I mean, you're saying that I can't read and write the file at the same time. Uh, it depends on the application. I can do it the VM anytime I want. A week. So therefore, if I make it a VM and start restoring okay. and writing and using all the technology that's available to me instead of Zen, instead of VMware, instead of Hyper-V, they all have it. Yes. No, I've said it's Tell me I can't do that because it's not there. Well, the technology does exist. The question is, is are you making use of it? We don't, we don't do verification today. So half of my backup is bad. So you're basically saying, yep, backup is good, the bits look good, it smells right, it looks right, but I haven't verified it. Hey, in disaster time comes, people don't test their restores so they find out half their backups are the tape and missing 14, 14 million bits of their data. That happens to be the most crucial stuff for the CEO that day. So now we have a massive restoration issue. Okay. So if I can't restore my data, what, how, my backup's no good. 
So why aren't we concentrating on restoration issues and testing those restorations instead of getting the data to the disk or to well, faster? What we concentrate on is making sure the backup works. We put a tremendous amount of effort into that. But if you don't that. verify, how can you tell if my backup we do, works? We, we do have basic verification. We don't mount a virtual machine. But we verify the data that we backed up was the actual data that exists on the backup target. We can do that. Now, the thing is, we, again, we don't mount the virtual machine, but we are able to verify that, that the backup exists. So uh, the backup actually matches the data that was, um, that was being backed so up. So in transit, I start here, I get to the server, <coughs> yep, verifies, now I drop it to tape. That part of it could go back. No, no, we verify it on, verify? No, we verified on tape. So we verified on tape. Yeah, it's a post-processing event. So we you verified do do on tape. verification. Well, we don't mount the virtual machine. You were asking about mounting the virtual you do machine. You a form of verification. Yeah, yeah. To verify that the of course. Some match. Of course. But the thing about it is, is that we're working very hard on making sure because we have very, uh, you know, we've had disasters in, that have occurred in the past where NetPack was involved in many, many restores, and 9/11 uh, is a good example of this. I don't like quoting that because it's not a you know, a very nice memory, but exactly. I mean, I know, but we had a lot of customers that had to restore data for 9/11, and we had not one. We sent engineers out to many of these customers to make sure they that they could do things uh, quickly. We did not have one case where one customer could not restore critical data that they had backup tapes or backup uh, destination available. Not one. So, I mean, we're trying very hard to make sure that that data so you is verified. Yes. Well, you it wasn't work complete VM backups. No, Those no, were just data. Right, right. I mean, but I mean the the process of taking that data from disk yeah. and putting it to a destination is really very similar in concept. Whether the virtual machine itself is corrupt is uh, is another question. But uh, we're we're talking about the data itself. Well, data is, for me, the data is the virtual machine. I mean, data is subtly changing from the data that's in the database to the whole mm -hmm. virtual machine. Or more importantly, to the whole application. Yeah. No. So if I can't restore that application with all its affinity rules, with all its storage profile rules, with all of the bits of data available, with all the interconnections available, which also, by the way, includes my virtual switch connections. So if I can't restore my application as an application, right now we're concentrating on the VM, the VM, the VM. Great, wonderful. We've been doing that for years. Why can't I concentrate on the bigger picture of the application, which means I get more of my environment that needs to be backed up, or at least known, so that when I do the restore, it happens automatically. I don't have to worry about making my virtual switches, making my connections between all my bits and pieces of that application. I have a diagram of an application that has 30 different VMs in multiple different tiers. To me, that's fairly complex. But I want all of that restored and mass so that I actually have. When I put restore it, I don't have to think about it. So we spend um, both net backup and backup exec. And this, this is going back to that, you know, the legacy semantic backup organization. We focus absolutely on the integrity of that data. Primarily, that's what we're focused on. So in terms of your validation, you speak guys know much more about the validation being <coughs> I we were just talking about that, so no pick of the mud. There is there is a validator application in B that will bring up virtual machines in a sandbox, and you can run you know, okay. a SQL server, you can run scripts against it. There's a bunch of custom stuff that you can do. But I don't know if notification is built, and I can't remember. Well, if, I can't, if it fails, I better get notified. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to have to look at a screen because, well, quite frankly, I'll never look at the screen. It's a, it, I it's want a, to be notified. It's a plugin into the vCenter. Okay. So all that comes up in the vCenter, but I can't remember what the notifications look like off the top of my head. So that's something that I've written down that we need to go take a look at. So you guys do have sandboxing. Backup exec has a sandbox. Backup exec, yeah. Backup exec, yeah. yeah. But not the bigger net backup. Uh -huh. That's right. But do you, so I can now use the sandbox to test the app, but do you restore, do you automatically <coughs> create the sandbox or do I have to do it? We do it. So you automatically create it using the same virtual switch constructs. Well, yeah, but the same isolated. affinity rules, right. the same profile rules. It, it takes all the configuration information and kind of plugs it in off to the side and okay. isolates it, of course, because you don't want that to interfere with can your production you, network. Can you save that information so that when I actually come to do my restore, <laughs> that information goes away? 
save it, like, what do you mean save it? So you're creating a sandbox automatically. Uh-huh. Can and you create So maintain a, the sandbox? Let it no, maintain a, an application. Just call it an application, whatever's in that sandbox. Can I go and say, push a button, say, restore that to my DR, my brand new <coughs> DR site, not as a sandbox, but as the live thing, and you take care of recreating all the little bits, just like you do for the sandbox. So like once you've got the sandbox it's like working, a, here's the easy template. button. All I so need is that easy button, big red easy button. Yeah, and done. No, <laughs> right, and the, the big red easy button button doesn't work for restore all the time, and we can talk a little bit about that. But if you recreated but, everything, like all my networking, all my storage, right. all my scraps, what kind? That would help. Okay. We're kind of getting into more of a business continuity discussion. Absolutely. Backup, right? backup is business continuity. It's a piece, right? It's a huge piece, but yeah. DR is guy breathing down my neck. I have a half hour to get everything restored, or even less. I mean, you're talking about in a major DR when, let's say, her, the Katrina hurricane. I got a call the very next day. We're in Dallas. We're restoring. Can you send us that document you wrote? I was told by my manager at the time that hey, if they need you to fly out, you're gone. You're there. I guess like, no problem. It's the pro thing is, is that that is people breathing down your neck, major disaster. It has to work. It can't be, I got a failure here. It can't be, oh, how do I recreate things? Because the documentation could have been washed away as well. well the so backup has to contain all that. So, and you're, you're looking at at the time of disaster is when you want to start the restore process or do you want some ability to I want to be able to push a button. Push a button and have machines like let's let's take the sandbox for example. So for example I have a truck just rolled up with thirty blades of blading foot racks and blades. Okay. And this, this is my this is HP who will allow me to or that go or branch and HP yeah. IBMs, you name it. They have tra uh, tractor trailers ready to roll if you buy that level of insurance. Right. Right and they'll roll to wherever you want them to go. Right. They'll open up the back, you walk in, there's going to be a big red button that says restore. Okay. And that's basically, I plug in my tape or I plug into wherever I'm at my network, wherever I stored it in the cloud, push the button that says recreate it all and let it just stream out. Okay. That would be ideal. So. And I guess you know some of it goes further we'll, than the leadership we'll, machine, right? We'll, he's talking about we'll touch on restoring that. settings of your host. Yeah, yeah but and, and one of the you things know. that we'll, we'll talk <clears> about with Backup Exec when we get started in just a while is this concept of doing conversions before the disaster occurs and having a warm standby ready. So, but the thing is, you never know when a disaster is going to occur. But, so. it, but it occur, but you can make that as part of your protection scheme, so it's constantly. You can run them as constantly well. staging well, things and ready to go. Net, hurricanes and natural disasters, roughly, you have a pretty good idea when the bad weather's going to hit. Right. You may only have three hours. So, yeah, I can push the button to start that. Well, no, the, but let's, I, let's get to that when we get to back of exec and we'll talk through some of this. Some disasters you just can't forget. I already scheduled my disasters on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do it on Friday. So the concept behind what we put in Kelly is and Garrett, done. With, with some of the integration with application HA, with we'll, that, we'll talk about talk, that yeah, too. Yeah, let's talk about that. We so have some integration. That, that's so. kind of, yeah, there's some interesting things that we're doing around, you know, staging and doing stuff that occurs during the backup to prepare for the disaster and not waiting until the disaster occur and then trying to find your tapes. And, yeah, and get all that together. There's I mean, if, you, if the disaster is big enough, you're not going to find your tapes. Right, and that's the whole point of this: is that having if the disaster is big enough, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, a disaster that covers 200 square miles right. is big enough to wipe out most backup, even your disaster recovery sites, if they're that close together. And they were. 200 miles. Most people would think that's that's enough, but. You may need to be three thousand miles apart. Well, it'd be one area. That's the thing. Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll, we'll way, touch on. You know, they mentioned half HA. We've got some integration there. Some. One more. Yeah. Questions. 